welcome back to the Metal Voice. Wasp, Thank you for having singer. me, guys. Yeah, it's a pleasure. He's got the he's got the guts to be somebody. Blackie Lawless himself with us here today. Now, aren't you ashamed that you said that like that? I'm just teasing. Go ahead. Let, um, let's let's get to the most important thing right up top. How is your health these days? You know, when people say how is your health, that makes it sound to me like mm. you know, like someone had an illness or something like that. And I, maybe it's my sports background because for me, injuries are different. You know, what I've been dealing with is injuries. You know, so um, but. You know, it's coming along. You know, what I had was was pretty serious. And when it first started last year, they told me that if we didn't stop, that we were in Europe. And um, I had a a chiropractor come into one of the shows to, to do an adjustment on me. And we were in Madrid. But the night before we had been in Barcelona, I did what I thought was the best show in the whole tour. Wow. At that point, and I was doing well. This guy comes in. He doesn't speak any English, and this kid is strong as a gorilla. And, he, you know, we tried to, through the interpreter, explain to him what we wanted to do. This kid got a hold of me, and he tweaked me. And I felt it immediately when he did it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he literally twisted my upper torso. We find out later he ruptures a disc in my back. Oh, yeah. And I had heard of those before, you know, dealing with nerve pain and things like that, but I'd never experienced it. And until you've experienced nerve pain, you just don't, you can't imagine what that feels like. I mean, it's, it's constantly on 10 and you can't stop it. So, um, we go, we leave Spain and we go to Berlin and we got, uh, fortunately we had some contacts there. And we were able to get in to see the German or the the doctors from the German Olympic team, and so they did a, a series of, of tests on me. and did you know MRIs and and things like that. They came back and they said, you know, you've got extensive damage. If you don't stop this tour, it's going to get worse. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what are we talking about? How much worse can it get? And so. <laughs> I told them, I says, basically what I need you to do for me is to get me through this. What can you do for me that can, can help me get along? So over a series of five weeks, we do eight epidurals, hmm. and which is for those that don't know what that is, and they inject a, a needle in, you know, next to your spinal cord and uh, basically try to put anti-inflammatory uh, medication in there to get you through it. And, but eight is an extreme amount. So, yeah, I mean, it's a lot. You know, usually the average person might get one or two of those, but uh, that's a lot. And But what happened is, yes, it was helping me get through it, but now I have one of the discs that's no longer functioning the way it should, now the vertebrae are starting to rub on each other. Oh. It creates a chain reaction where a second disc gets ruptured, and then one of the vertebrae cracks because it's bone rubbing on bone. Yeah. And so, like I said, it literally became a domino effect. And w we didn't know any of this until the tour was done, and I get back to uh, California and we do another battery of tests, and we can see what's going on. And it was, um, it was not good, you know. So dealing with that, you know, I had to have two different surgeries. They go in, they clean out the debris because the, you know, when the bone broke, um, you know, it starts to create fragments and shards. And so they got to go in there and clean all that out because all that is now trying to create, you know, complications around the spinal cord. It's, you know, it's creating nerve damage and things like that. So, and then on top of that, it starts to form scar tissue. So it's, um, it's a tedious, tedious process. And it's been 10 months, and uh, I'm still not quite out of the woods just yet, but we're getting there. I, I you know. saw you, I saw that the last video that for Sweden Rock Fest, you were sitting down. Um, I, 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 and I know there's a North American tour that's coming up in October. What are your hopes of, you know, 
getting back on your feet at full strength by then? Well, you know, I'm up, I'm up walking around, I'm exercising, you know, doing all the physical therapy and everything I'm supposed to do. They basically what I told uh, the people at Sweden Rock was, I'm on probation, and the doctors told me, he said, yeah, you can do the show, but you know, we don't want you running any marathons. We want to make sure that this this thing heals completely and totally, and you don't have any setbacks. So that was that was the compromise that we had to make to do it. But um, you know, I'm fully expecting that uh, they'll give me the green light any time now. I, you know, I see the doctors again this week, and I'll know more then. What's so the go ahead? Go ahead, Jim. I was going to say, what's the pain level? Like, you know, they show you a little picture and they go, you know, zero to ten. What 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 pain level are you on now? Zero. Oh, well, that's great news. They told me, well, they told me when we did the surgery that the pain would be completely gone, and that was very difficult for me to believe because I don't know if you guys have ever experienced nerve pain before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's it's on a whole different level, you know. And for those that don't know what it is, think of it as it's the body's way of telling you something's wrong, right? You know, whenever we have any kind of level of pain. Well, let's say uh, you drop a book on your foot, and the brain or the the foot sends a signal to the brain to tell you how bad it is. And on a scale of one to ten, ten being the worst. Let's say the the foot tells you it's a two. All right. The brain then interprets that and says, all right, we know it hurt, but it's not life-threatening, so don't worry about it. It'll stop in a minute. When it goes up higher, let's say you, you drop, you know, a 100-pound brick on your foot, that pain then goes from two to an eight. And that, again, is the brain's way of telling you something is seriously wrong here. We need to get this looked at. Well, what happens is that when those signals are sent from the damaged area to the brain, it's the spinal cord that opens up and tells the brain how bad it is and vice versa. Mm -hmm. The spinal cord, whether we know it or not, is always on 10. We just don't feel it. That's the body's way of... Uh, like I said, uh, of sending these signals to us. When you're dealing with nerve pain, whatever that injured area is, is constantly on 10, and you cannot shut it down. And so when you go and you see those little faces that you're talking about of the pain level (laughs) of 10, it's an absolute 10, and you cannot stop it. And this was going on throughout the tour last year when we were in Europe. And... A hundred and well, eight epidurals and a hundred and eighty opium tablets later. Oh, that's what it took to get me through that tour because you know you re aggravated every night you're out there and trying to go to sleep. I mean, you, you know, I was averaging between four and five of the opium tablets a night. They use opium over there, where you know, over here we use you know, mostly like it would be either like Percocet or Norco, something like that, you know, as far as opioids. They use, it's also a synthetic form. It has the same sort of effect, um, but it's just a little bit uh, different the way they do it there. But 180 of anything is a lot. You know, and I was averaging about four a night to try to get to sleep, and I wasn't getting to sleep until it, it really relaxed, and I was averaging getting to sleep usually about noon the next day. You know, so you get up at six in the evening to get ready to do the next show, and then you start the cycle all over again. And uh, so, for anybody that uh, you know, like I said, that's never experienced it, I told I told the doctors, I said, you know what? I said, forget all these movies you see, you know, where guys are getting their fingernails pulled off and stuff to get them to talk. You know, all you got to do is just threaten them with this. They think yeah. you'd give up your kids. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, it's like, forget it. I mean, they, you know, somebody asks you a question, you're going to tell them everything you know. <laughs> and they told me later, and I, th- I thought I was making a joke, but they told me that, you know, captured pilots during the Second World War were threatened with it. Because what you can do 
is you can take a needle and you can put it into the spinal cord. Eesh. It creates the same effect. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. trust me, you don't want to know. No, no, no. Yeah. Well, that's the last time we had you on. The prognosis sounded like it was going to be positive, and, and I'm glad it turned out that way. And, and now we're it talking is, about the. It's just been lengthy, you know. Yeah. Well, the the good news is the tour, right? There's yeah. a North American tour happening. We're in Canada. We're excited mm -hmm. because there's about four or five Canadian dates. We're in Montreal, but you're going all across North America. That's exciting. And you know what? You're playing the debut album. So what, why did you make that decision to say, guys, this time around, we're playing the debut? Well, when we did the last North American tour uh, almost two years ago, it was the celebration of the 40th anniversary. And when we finished with it, you know, we looked around and we said, all right, what else significant is happening or was happening at that point? And, you know, the, the date, August 17th. 1984 was significant because that was the day that first album was released. So we have not done the album in its entirety since that original tour. And so, you know, people had asked for it before. And quite honestly, you know, a lot of times when you're the person that creates something, you don't ever really see it like other people will see it because you're on the inside of that bubble. When I tested this idea on the first half a dozen people that that I trust, different promoters around the country and things like that, the reaction was not just positive. I mean, basically, the word I kept hearing over and over was, oh, shit. <laughs> you know? and, and, and it was the same every time. And I thought, really? You know, and it's the, the reaction, like I said, it wasn't just positive. It was it was almost one of those visceral reactions, mm -hmm. and I thought huh, maybe we got something here, <laughs> you know. And so, like I said, but you can be, and the reason that you know the artists a lot of times can be naive to that is that we're on the inside and we just don't see it like someone mm -hmm. else would. And so, you know, I had a, a friend of mine who's a promoter that I trust a lot, and he was telling me, you know, that this needs to be done or when you do it that they need to be done in chronological order the way they are the running order is on the album and i argued him up and down on that i go well listen that means you know we need to start with i want to be somebody you know we've never done that before you know you're throwing a monkey wrench into my whole plan here and he <laughs> says listen he goes if zeppelin got back together and they did zeppelin <laughs> four he says do you want to hear that album in its proper running order and I sit there and I thought, yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> you yeah. know, so it's like, you know, I mean, it's a hard argument to make, you know, so like I said, when you're on the inside, it's always more difficult to see it the way the average person or the average fan is going to see it. So after going back and forth with these guys a number of times, I came to the conclusion they are correct. If you're going to do it in its entirety, you need to do it in its proper running order. Yeah, yeah, I would agree for sure. And, uh, you know, going back to the day, I mean, the original Shockmeisters and, and, and the promos, uh, Wasp was definitely ahead of the pack. And, uh, you know, was there any idea that what you guys deemed was too extreme, that oh, we can't do that kind of thing? Not for us. You know, I mean, <laughs> we with us, there was always a lot of humor with what we were doing. And I remember, you know, one day we were, you know, especially when the whole PMRC thing took off. We were watching TV one day, and there was hardly a day went by where we we weren't on television in some incarnation, somewhere, some way. And I remember us talking about it and really looking at each other and saying, what's the big deal? Because we didn't get it. You know, we thought, you know, we're doing a show basically to entertain ourselves. <laughs> and if the audience gets off on it, well, that's great too, you know, but we had no idea that it would cause a stir that it did, you know, but again, that's, uh, the artist being on the inside of the bubble, not seeing it like the rest of the world does. Did you actually put raw meat in your mouth back in the day? Well, yeah, don't we oftentimes? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. This is a little too raw for me. <laughs> Well, steak tartare, right? Yeah, that's it. It's tartare. They're serving it all over the place now. <laughs> there you go. 
a man to my defense. <laughs> you know, but it was, well, I'll tell you how the, that happened was we were looking, there was a, a type of experimental theater that was going on out here at uh, the University of California, well, UCLA, and it was called psychodrama. And what psychodrama is about is where you take whatever's happening on the stage and you try to put it into the audience to create audience participation. So, in other words, the actors or whoever the performers were on the stage, they would literally come down off the stage, create interactive participation. And so I thought that that was really neat because, I mean, for lack of a better term, let's call it 3D theater. So, you know, I looked at that and I thought, hmm, interesting idea. What could we do that would do something that, would take whatever's happening on the stage and put it in the audience because, and most people never think about it, but when you go to see a live performance and there's a stage, there's this invisible magical barrier that exists between the stage and the audience. And it's kind of like, um, you know, when you get into theater, whether it be movies or things like that, where you have the concept uh, especially, you know, here in Hollywood, you know, where they make movies, the concept of the suspension of disbelief is a very, very important thing. In other words, the audience can come in or the audience members can go to a movie, watch a concept of something that they know is not real, but somehow if the story is good enough and the story is being told well, you get sucked into it and you accept it, that understanding that it is not real, but you go along with it anyway. You know, and there's there's a million of these concepts, you know, Star Wars, anything like that, that is not based in reality, or at least the reality that we know of. And so, again, you know, we, we were looking for that idea of what could we do to to break that magical barrier that existed between the stage and the audience. In other words, where the audience thought they were safe, what do we do to then shatter that that magic pane of glass in between the stage and the audience? And as crude as the meat was, it did just what we wanted it to do. Because the audience, thinking they're safe, now realizes they are not safe. They're sitting ducks. We're in the firing and line. The, I'm sorry, what was that? We're, we're, they're, they're in the firing line. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, you put them in a room where, you know, they're jam-packed in there like sardines. They can't move. And they were in a very vulnerable position. And so, like I said, the psychological advantage that that gives the performer at that point, you have then literally shattered that, that magic pane of glass from the stage to the audience. The audience is no longer in that traditional safe position. You know, so like I said, as crude as it was, it had a very interesting psychological effect on, on the audience, how you could take what was happening on the stage and literally infiltrate the audience with it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, looking back, you, you can see all of this, uh, these types of promotions, uh, but at the same time, you know, the plasmatics were blowing up police cars, etc. But the, I think the one thing Wasp had over a lot of those different bands was the music. I mean, this is one of the greatest debut albums, of, uh, metal albums of all time, as far as I'm concerned. So the quality, the musicianship, it, it was all there compared to some other people that are just trying to get the shock value. Well, you know, it was interesting when the record first came out. We went to the UK first, and I started doing press there, and I probably did 20 or 30 interviews initially before we got into mainland Europe. And the first few interviews that I did, no one wanted to talk about the record. All they wanted <laughs> to talk about was the show. And I found that strange. And again, you're the artist, you're on the inside of the bubble, you don't see it the way the rest of the world does. And so, you know, I you know, did what they asked. I answered the questions. But after you're talking to somebody for 30 minutes and all they're talking about is the show, and I'm saying to them, well, you know, the, the show's wonderful and all that, but what we did this record over here, and we <laughs> think it's okay. You know, can we talk about that for a minute? 
<laughs> and they would like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And they weren't getting it. And I realized that that's when it, it started to hit us to understand that people listened a lot of times with their eyes and not their ears. And that was the first time I was ever introduced to that concept. And as much as you try to tell people, you know, give this thing a fair shake, give it a chance, really listen to it, they, the show was so overpowering that they were not able to hear what the music was. And I would tell them, I'd say, you know what, if we're driving down, the, or if you're driving down the street and this record comes on the radio, we can't jump out onto the dashboard of your car and start doing this show. <laughs> you know, that music has to stand on its own. And if it does not, we really don't have a lot to talk about here, do we? And you could see the deer in the headlights look in their faces when I would say that to them. And they they didn't disagree. But again, I could see that they were running the show back in their heads as they were talking to me. It took years for what you're saying about people learning to appreciate, especially, you know, from writers perspectives to appreciate what that original record was and now like you said it's considered i mean it it ranks pretty high in debut records and i'm thinking to myself well where were all those guys when that record first came out (laughs) you know because they were just they were so overwhelmed you know by what was happening visually and again that's when you know we were had discovered or, or faced the reality if you like that Whenever people are given sight and sound at the same time, unfortunately, people will usually listen with their eyes and not their ears. You know, um, so that that becomes yeah. a kind of a double-edged sword. Oh yeah, yeah, and a lot of shock artists went through that. Um, mm-hmm. But you are doing the debut album. It is a monumental album. I mean, is this the right time, perhaps, to bring the Randy Piper and and Chris Holmes just for a few songs, or is because because before your sort of wasp was progressing, right? It's Blackie and his boys at the moment. But now we're going back in time. Is it the right time to bring at least maybe some guest appearances by some guys who played on that album? If the one. climate were right, you would be correct. But that climate is not right. Um, there's... There's water under the bridge that I could not see that ever happening. But allow me to say this. What I'm attempting to do here with this show is create an environment not dissimilar to what we did in the beginning. Because a lot of times nowadays, if you have uh, you know bands that try to recreate an 80s environment, and and there are these bands out there that you know you know of uh, that try to do that, and they play you know largely '80s music, and you know they want to do an '80s retro thing whenever they they do shows, and that's wonderful. But the difference is between that and this is that those people normally weren't there in the beginning, and what I'm trying to accomplish with this show is I want to create an environment not where you're just coming to hear some older songs. The same way we did the last tour where we created the circus environment, I told my tour manager, you know, I wanted, when people walked in the room, I wanted them to smell the sawdust on the floor. (laughs) So we were able, we were able to find a few things to help create that effect. One of them was the the fog juice that we use in the show now. And for people that don't know what that is, whenever you see fog on the stage, it goes into this little machine. The machine heats it up, and that's what creates the fog you see on the stage. Well, in the business, it's called fog juice because it's literally in a, in a bottle. Of, you know, it's liquid. You get it, you know, a quart at a time. You pour it in the machine. Nowadays, because the original stuff used to smell really bad, they have it in different flavors now. <laughs> and one of the things that they had that's just had just been developed in the last three or four years was two different scents. One of them was cotton candy, and the other one was hot dogs. And so I, we got that, and we would start pumping that into the room when the people would, before the show even started. 
And the psychological effect that that had on people was pretty amazing because it was putting them into an environment. They didn't know what they were getting ready to walk into because no one had seen that show yet. You know, they didn't know what it was going to look like. You know, and then they see, you know, that that stage literally came alive looking like the inside of a circus tent and but prepping them before the show started with all that psychological stuff like i said smell is a very very potent powerful weapon oh yeah you know when it's used correctly you know it triggers memory all those things and so you know we were setting the environment before you know the show ever started to happen well similar to that what i want to do with this one is when you walk into the room and you see this show, I do not want people looking just or, or, or listening just to what they think is something that they remember or a record they heard. I want to take you back to that moment because most of the audience that are at these shows never lived through it. I don't want to just have you listen to, to an older record. I want to take you back to where that time and space was. And for the two hours that we're in there, I want to turn that clock back to make you think you're actually living through it. And with what we're doing with this, it's interesting because when I saw the original videos put together for the promos on this tour, it even hit me hard because whenever we had done promo videos for tours before, it was usually you know, a 60-second or a 30-second retrospective of the entire career of the band. So you saw different clips that span 30, 40 years. This was concentrated to the first year and a half of the band. And when I saw it, like I said, it hit me like a ton of bricks because it was all concentrated in that first 18 months we were together as a band. And the intensity that comes out of that when you see it or you see any of those promo videos it hit me like a ton of bricks, wow. you know, to, to try to take people to dare to try to take people back and put them in that, that space mentally and emotionally. And even if you didn't live through it, that's what I'm going to attempt to do on this. So the liquid fog this time around would be the denim and leather smell or locker room sweat yeah. smell? <laughs> Spirit, spilled beer we'll and, uh, spilled and beer, red meat. Nick and and red meat and... Well, we'll see what's on the menu. <laughs> but these are interesting concepts i mean the idea of theater i mean these things are interesting you know it's like what can you do because that's one of the things that you know ai and computer are never going to be able to do you know i heard, i read some just somewhere you know a couple of days ago somebody was saying that you know live performance is the only thing that computers haven't been able to to duplicate and never will and there is a truth to that, because if you go back and you look at the history of show business, you know, as uh, I mean, let's go back 150 years, let's say um, for every time there was a technological event, revolution, whatever you want to refer to it as show business was literally recreated or and changed every time. And in a lot of ways, decimated and devastated in the process. Because let's say you go back to old vaudeville theater. For people to see that, they had to go to the theater. Okay, that was the accepted norm back, say, around you know, the early 1900s. Then this new thing called radio comes out. Now people don't need to necessarily go to a theater to get some form of entertainment. Okay, that has a major effect on vaudeville as we know it. Then comes silent films. That has an even greater effect. Ten years after that, talkies come into being. So every time some technological revolution has happened, it's changed show business in ways that are unrecognizable. And a lot of people literally get, they become casualties of it, the performers. And a lot of them cannot make the transition from where they were to where, tech, where it goes technologically. And so it, it, it continues on. You know, we see it happen again in television in the 50s. And now we're going through it again with computers. 
you know so again you can, we can study this and we can see the effects that it has every time technological our technology has changed we see it has this enormous effect on show business as we know it and those that can adapt and change can survive and for those that can't they won't but what's interesting i think in a lot of ways with this is to go back and look at the way it was done originally and to say, okay, what can we take from that that a computer can never regenerate? I'll give you an example. We've all heard the expression being in the limelight. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an old showbiz expression, but it's more real than people realize because what happened in the old days before we had electricity, like, you know, I was talking about old vaudeville theater and things like that. You've, if you've ever seen a picture of an old theater stage, they have things that look like half clamshells that are all around the front of the stage. Well, nice. those had, you know, like almost like chrome reflective surfaces on the inside. And they had a thing that was wax string. And they, that wax string would burn. They would light it. And it created a flame and it reflected off the inside of this thing that looked like a clamshell. And it, it created, you know, the light that we saw, or the footlights that we see on stage. But what was interesting about the wax is the wax had a smell of lime to it. It was lime wax. Hmm. So when it burnt, it smelled like lime. So that's where we hear the expression being in the limelight oh, comes okay. from, because that's literally what it was. So even then, unbeknownst to them at the time, it was the only way they could create that effect. But it was also creating a back, they were triggering memory again for those that had walked in and smelled it as a kid. You know, so anytime you can do something like that, those are things, like I said, that computers cannot do. So I'm, I'm going a long way, you know, around the corner here to, to make a point that live performance is an experience. You can go to a movie theater and you can have an experience there. And as wonderful as that may be, there's something about the human interaction. I mean, concerts, that, as we know them, have always been designed to be a communal type of experience. And you're not going to get that. You can watch a pay-per-view pay event on television, and those may be great, but it's not the same as being there, especially if it's really good, whatever is happening on the stage. And that's that's something that... You know, we just don't want to trade off. And, you know, it's been a kind of a double-edged sword, but I think that the, the whole COVID thing woke a lot of people up to that newfound appreciation, especially when they couldn't get out. Yeah. And once they that. did, it really, you know, it created an environment in people's heads of being starved for that. And I think it's helped reintroduce people to that concept of the communal environment that I'm talking about. So, you know, as, as tragic as what we had to go through was with that, this is one byproduct of it that ended up being a good thing, I think. On, on the music front, is there any chances of a remix of the original album with a debut? Not exactly in the way that you're thinking. <laughs> I, I tell you what, we'll talk okay. later in the year. Something is happening. <laughs> okay. Something is happening, but I don't want to tell you something until it's absolutely in stone because I don't want to dangle a carrot in front of people and then it not happen. So as we get further into the year and I know that it's happening for real, we'll talk again. All right. All right. Good. On tour, you'll tell us about it. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll talk about it before the tour starts. Okay. Good. Providing yeah. you, you'll be gracious enough to have me again. For sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Hey, I, I found an old interview with Alice Cooper in 2005 that says, uh, short of, you know, killing yourself or chopping off your arm, audience cannot be shocked anymore. What do you think about that? Do you, you agree? I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I mean, I understand what he's saying about conventional thinking. Um and I won't go into detail of why I'm saying what I'm saying. Um, but I, I just, I have a difference of opinion on that. I think it can be done. 
All right. Good. I guess we'll, wait we'll to find see. Out. We'll find out pretty soon. Um, what is so you're going to play the debut album in its entirety from start to finish, the way it's listed on the tracks. Where does F Like a Beast fit? And will there be extra songs or greatest hits? Maybe uh, I'm assuming it's not long enough, the first album, for a whole performance, correct? There'll be a part one and a part two. Okay. So there'll be an okay. intermission in between, you know, about five, six minutes. And then we'll come back and we'll do the second part, which will be like, a you know, a greatest hits type of, uh, you know, presentation. But, you know, and asking, answering your original question about, you know, the running order and the songs on it, Animal was never part of that record. Yeah. There have been remakes that, um, you know, that had, you know, but it also had B-sides and things like that. So where do you draw the line? You know, when we originally intended this, or, or what was intended originally, should I say, was the album as it was released. And to try to get into any of that other material, it's just not part of the record. You know, so I would say that, you know, any of that stuff that could potentially be done, if it's going to be played, would be played in the second half but it's not going to be part of the original album because it was never part of the original album. Yeah, it was an it was an, it was released in England, right? And it had to be imported back into the US and North America. That that's what happened. Correct. Right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I remember when that happened. Jeez, that was a big thing. Yeah, and I think it, to my knowledge it was the first time that once a, a major label had signed an artist that that label had been backed off and allowed an independent to come in and, and release uh, product from an artist. We, yeah, I don't think it had ever happened before that. I, I don't even know if it's happened since. <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. How, how large well, was... you know, when, when EMI signed us, um, somehow the song got leaked to um, to the government in the UK, and the the three heads of EMI were told that if they were, and this went before what's called Queen's Council, it would be, you know, in the United States, it'd be equivalent of our Congress, you know, something like that. But they were told that they released that song. They were each going to jail for 28 days apiece. Oh. And <laughs> so that got their attention. And these were things that, you know, as an artist, when you're trying to do something, you can't plan this. It has. It ends up taking a life form of its own, and when it does, it, it it creates a snowball effect a lot of times. So, like I said, these are things that, you know, most most artists would salivate to have happen. But again, us being on the inside, you know, you, you know, you got to understand you're dealing with kids, you know, that are are making these records. And I would love to sit here and tell you that all that stuff was part of a master plan that we have because a lot of people think <laughs> it was, but it wasn't. Like I said, you're, you're dealing with a, with a bunch of kids in, in a whacked out rock and roll band. Yeah. It, yeah. When you look, well, go ahead, Alan. Sorry. Alan Black, I got in my hands here a heavy metal heroes, uh, wasp, uh, interview with you back from 86. And, and you, you came right on and said, you know, wasp is not for everybody you know they should be asking the kids what they're what they're listening what they're watching because it's not meant for for all ages well you know if you think about rock and roll in general rock and roll is a subculture you know and in, in its purest form it was never designed to be for the masses you know i mean it you know for its time again now we go back and we look historically at show business we see Frank Sinatra for his time period would have been radical. Uh, then, you know, the yep. next decade is Elvis. Elvis next the pelvis. decade after that is the British <laughs> invasion. You know, so all these things for their time period were extremely radical. You know, so, and, you know, then, you know, the 80s come along and we're part of that. You know, so I think each each decade, you know, the artists are trying to push the envelope a little if they can. Um but like I said, we're dealing with with subcultures here at best. It's not like, you know, it's something that's, you know, we're not out playing Beethoven and, and Mozart. You know, it's not from mainstream. It never was designed to be. Yeah. You know, so like I said, any anybody that's doing what we do 
you know, if you can get some sort of crossover success, uh, that's a big deal in, in the rock and roll world. You know, so like I said, but any subculture, you know, you're going to, that's what you're going to have to deal with. What, what was the biggest religious pushback back in the day that kind of shocked you? My family was originally from Florida, and my sister was living in Florida at the time. She's now in California, but at the time, she told me she heard a, a preacher on on radio talking about me saying that I was a known child molester. And oh, that boy. really angered me. Um, you know, I got, there's, and I won't go deep into it, but those are subjects that, you know, I feel very strongly about. And whether it's rape or, you know, hurting a child in any way like that, I have a very visceral reaction to that. So for someone to try to lump me in to that, I was, that offended me greatly. And and especially, you know, someone, you know, is he telling an out and out lie? Well, yeah, it was. Did he know it was? Well, probably not. But whether he did or he didn't, unless you know what you're talking about, keep your mouth shut. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. If that happened today, he'd be sued uh, every day, you know. Yeah. He wouldn't have a penny left well, to his name. Yeah, but you'd be surprised. Because I remember, you know, and, and NBC had a, uh, Geraldo Rivera had a TV show on uh, NBC at the time. And I remember he was doing something about the record, and he said that I was a known Satanist. <laughs> <laughs> Geraldo did a whole show on that. He did a whole show on that. And I remember our lawyers sent, you know, a, a thing to NBC saying, telling them we were going to sue him over it. And their re- NBC's response to us was, We'll get in line, you know. It'll come to you know. It'll come to trial sometime in the year 2050. You know, I mean, they just didn't care. Yeah. You know, so when you're dealing with a powerful organization like that, that's usually the response you get. Yeah, you want to sue us? Go ahead, get in line. Yeah. Well, what, what do you think about it today? F, you know, animal left like a beast, and you look. Okay, I get it. We're young. You know, in the 20s, we just want to go to the extremes, but what do you, when you look back now, do you go, you're proud of that or you weren't proud of it? How do you feel about it today? Well, you know, I think any true art, and it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's music, movies, painting, sculpture, you know, things like that. They're true reflections of whatever that artist is feeling at the moment. And you can do things that you think are trendy but it always comes off as being forced. You know, it, it, there's not a, 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 it's not genuine. And, you know, if you look at us, I think the one thing that separated us from most other bands that ever tried to do something like this was that other bands that did it came off animated, you know, almost cartoony-like. And the ones that had success at it were the ones that, you looked at them and you thought, these guys believe in what they're doing. And I remember we were, we were in the process of recording the Headless Children. And that was about five years down the road from where our first record came out. I went in, I went into a restaurant one night. It was like a rock place. And they were playing the video from Live at the Lyceum that we had done on the first um, UK tour. And, you know, I sat down at the table and I couldn't help but see it because, like I said, it's on a big screen TV. And I looked at it and I was stunned because I was now looking at myself through a filter I had never been able to do before. Because I'm looking, I'm now an artist that's five years down the line. You know, I've three world tours under my belt, you know, of met all my heroes, you know, all that stuff. You're no longer the same person you you were when you first started. And it's part of the growth, growth process that it's inevitable. You know, you're, you're not going to stay the same. You're going to change. You're going to move. You're going to evolve. You're going to grow. You know, and when I was watching it that night, you know, in that uh, restaurant, the thing that hit me more than anything was I could see for the first time 
what frightened parents about us. Because I looked at us up on that stage and I thought, whoa, look at this. These are not guys who are acting at this. They're not playing at it. These guys believe what they're doing. And that hit me more than anything. And I was never able to see that before. And the reason I couldn't see it is because we weren't acting at it. We were just being ourselves. You know, they tell you in any form of entertainment, just be yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what we were doing. That's the whole reason I said earlier when we were talking about we looked at, you know, the stink that this was causing. And we said, what's the big deal? We didn't understand. We couldn't get it, you know, because we were just being ourselves. But that's what was translating. And I could not understand that until I saw it that night. And it had a very similar reaction on the video that I saw put together for this tour. And I, I saw those clips from that first 18 months, and I looked at it, and I go, whoa, look at this. You know, no wonder this terrified parents when they looked at it. We were not out to do that. That ended up being a byproduct of what we were doing. But that wasn't the reason we did it. You know, the reason we did it, like I said, was largely to entertain ourselves. And we thought the audience would probably like it too. But we did not see it as shock value. And that may seem seem na either naive to you or unrealistic, but I'm telling you the truth. You know, we were just being ourselves. But you have to put some distance sometimes between where you maybe first started, and in this particular case, like I said, it was about five years down the road, uh, to be able to understand, you know, or, or, or at least see it somewhat as the rest of the world was seeing it. You know, that, that's... Is, uh, go ahead, go on. If I can just go to this interview here in this in this uh, hit parade here, uh, you know, you, you actually said that, hey, this is who we are. We, we are violent guys in the band. Can you expand upon that? At that time? Well, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say violent wouldn't have been the right word, but angry, absolutely. Yeah. You know, but, and that's the thing that we didn't get, and that's what was translating when I was watching it that night. Yeah. I was looking at four angry guys, and you say, "Well, why were you angry?" Well, you know, you come to to L.A. and you try to make it in the record business, and you starve, and I mean starve, for years on end. I mean, I went I went through one period for three years, no gas and no electricity. And you tell somebody that and you you know, I, and because I, I told people this story a million times, and you see the look on their face when you tell them, they cannot fathom what you're saying. They say, "Oh wow, that was really bad." No, they don't understand. So you know how I learned to tell people to get them to try to understand what it was like. I would say. Have you ever been through a situation where you, you didn't have any gas or electricity for a week? Yeah. That they can relate to. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, wow, you know, we lost our electricity. We was out for two days, and it was really bad. And, uh, and I said, okay, imagine it being a week. And then you see them kind of, you can see the Rolodex going in their head <laughs> yeah, as they're thinking. And then you say, try a month. Try a year. Yeah. Tried three. three years. <laughs> and when you put it to them in those terms, they then begin to understand what you're talking about. You know, because when you first, you throw a statement at them that they cannot absorb, they don't get it. You know, so you have to translate it in ways yeah. that people can then understand. And really then, because what happens is you literally get turned into an animal out here, but you don't realize it's happening. You know, it's only until you go, let's say, one of the guys, uh, Mike Duda, our bass player, he, him and I were talking about this just the other day. You know, he came out for, from Connecticut, and he had been here a couple of years already. And he met some girl uh, here in, in Southern California, and she invited him to her parents' house for dinner. And so he went, and he said he was sitting there at, you know, at the table, and he was so uncomfortable because he said they were really nice people, but he said he did not realize how far he had been removed from an environment like that. You slowly, incrementally get changed over a period of time. 
and you end up living like an animal. And to you, it's normal because, like I said, it happened incrementally. You know, it didn't happen just overnight to you like that. You know, right. you come out, you you go through all those periods of literal starvation and doing without. You know, in my particular case, like I said, before the three years of no gas, no electricity, I slept on people's floors for the first year and a half. You know, so you go through all of that, and it's a little like like being a dog you know, where every time, you know, somebody walks by you, they kick you. Well, after a while, you know, they keep kicking you. You will eventually bite them. Yeah. And that's what was happening to us. But you don't realize it because, like I said, it's happening slowly over a period of time. And when you finally do have this vehicle to lash out, to strike back with, you use it with all full force. And that, again, that's what we were doing. That's what I saw that night in the restaurant when I was looking at the Lyceum video, and I could see it for the first time. It's like, wow, these are some pissed off people. Yeah, authentic. You know? And it's like, <laughs> that's so that's, you know, the whole genuine byproduct, if you like, of what was happening was we were not acting at it. What you saw was, you know, like the whole punk movement. They tried to tell you that that was real. And I'm sure in a lot of cases it probably was. But for the most part, they were selling people an idea. We were not selling an idea. What you saw is what you got, buddy. Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me in a weird way, you know, like the Anvil movie. You know, why was that Anvil movie so successful? It was because it was genuine. It was real. Yeah. It, what, they, they didn't pull no punches. They didn't fake any scenes. It was is what you get. is, And that's art, right? It's 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 just letting yourself go and just being who you are. And, and I think that's the difference between what you were saying is faking it or trying to manipulate it versus actually living it and being it. Right. Well, you know, and then you, if you're fortunate enough, you have some degree of success and the, and then that changes you. <laughs> I mean, we signed, we signed the largest unsigned, or excuse me, we signed the largest deal in history for any previously unsigned band. It was for two and a half million dollars then. That was a lot of money forty years ago. Mm. And we, I, I was, I was in a, living in a place where it was ninety bucks a month was my rent. You know, it was it was a space that was nine feet by twenty two feet. I mean, it was a cube, you know, or a cubicle. I was living in. It was tiny, and. We bought James Cagney's old house in Beverly Hills. And so you literally go from, as they say, from the outhouse to the penthouse. Yeah. <laughs> and, but that will change. That changes you, too, over a period of time. You know, it's kind of like the old Rocky, Rocky three, where he wants to fight Mr. T and Burgess Meredith, who's, who plays <laughs> his manager. You know, he tells him, he goes, you can't, kid, you can't do this anymore. He says, he goes, I want to fight him one more time. He goes, listen, kid, he goes, the worst thing that could ever happen to a fighter happened to you. You got civilized. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happens to rock bands in a lot of ways, yeah. too, because, you know, you go from, from eating, you know, chili six nights a week, you know, to I remember the first time I went out with any of the label guys. And again, you got to remember, I, I had come from abject poverty and we went to this restaurant over in beverly hills and this was again this was 1984 and when the bill came to the table that night it was fifteen hundred dollars i had never seen anything like that before and i remember leaving that night thinking to myself i was offended by how obscene that amount of money for one meal for a half a dozen people was, you know, cause there was about, there was about five or six of us there that night, you know, all these guys had ordered some champagne and stuff like that. Well, that jacks the bill way up, you know, and that's, that's how that we didn't eat $1,500 of food, you know, but that's how that happens. And so it's hard for somebody driving a Ferrari to walk around angry. You know, again, these are incremental things that happen, and it does not happen overnight. 
But the trick is, you know, is there something that you can then still translate, you know, artistically? What are you feeling? You know, who are you? You know, can can you get back in touch with who you are? Because the first three, four years we were together, you know, we were doing a record and a tour and a record and a tour. You know, we didn't know who we were at the end of that cycle. You know, we were signed to Sanctuary Management, Music Management. Uh, and they had both us and Iron Maiden. And Maiden had gone through the same thing. where And it was ironic because we were doing the Somewhere in Time tour with them. They had made a record that they didn't believe in. We had done Inside the Electric Circus. We didn't believe in that record. You know, they were tired records done by tired bands. And we needed time to get away, you know, to to get reacquainted with who we were as people. Because when you first start that cycle, you start out broke. You have nothing. And then, like I said, you're fortunate enough to have success. And that, too, begins to change you. But it doesn't happen overnight as well. You know, all those things happen kind of slowly. Looking back now, it really wasn't as slow as it felt like it was in real time. You know, whenever you're going through something in real time, you know, this is kind of like, you know, the three years without the gas and electricity. You know, when you throw a number out like that, you know, you go, oh, wow, that sounds like a lot. Yeah, but when you're living through it day by day, it feels like it takes forever. You yeah. know, so like I said, it, that's that's kind of what it's like. And, you know, those changes, they sneak up on you when they happen. And, you know, the trick is, you know, can you stay focused enough to write something that's meaningful? You know, and that that really is the key. You know, can you can you still do that? And it gets. I think as artists progress in their careers, especially if you've been doing it, you know, twenty, thirty years, you know, can you still find something that you're motivated to write about? Well, that is a great segue. So uh, our last yeah. question for today yeah. will be: What? When is the next uh, new music? When? When are you planning on releasing some new music? Well, I just set those bowling pins up for you, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you did. You, you did. did. What, what what Could, couldn't have been more perfect. <laughs> uh, well, you know, first things first. I mean, we started working on new music about a year and a half ago, and sometimes you just need a little time to get away from it. After the tour, the the European tour was finished last year, you know, we came home and I listened to a lot of what we had done and there's moments of it that are good, but it's just nowhere near completed yet. So to answer, that's a kind of a long way to go about to tell you, I have no clue. <laughs> you know, I would love to tell you, you know, something more concrete, but I really don't know myself. And... um but that too is also, you know, you fall prey of not wanting to do something that's forced. You want to do it because you feel motivated to do it. In other words, is there something that you feel motivated enough to write about, to talk about? Okay. And it gets, because you, every artist starts raising the bar in their head, you know, as their career goes on. And so it's, it's impossible to write the way you once wrote. You know, where where I was writing from, you know, a perspective of pure anger in the beginning, I can't write from that anymore. I'd love to sit here and tell you I can, but I can't. No one can. You know, and if I, if I tried to do something where I was going to attempt to go back to that, it would sound forced. I mean, I haven't tried it, but my instinct tells me don't do anything that's not genuine, you know, just be yourself, you know, and l see if that can translate through to, to the listener, because if you don't, it's not believable. You know, I'm the kind of person that if I believe in something, man, I could talk to birds out of the trees, <laughs> but if I do not believe in it, I, I'm not a very good liar. You know, it's like, you know, you stand, look at your shoe tops and him haw around. You know, it's just like uh, you can tell whether somebody believes in what they're doing or not. You know, and and it, like I said, with the music, I don't think there's any way to hide that. Um, so to, to sum it up, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll let you know when we know. Okay. Be ready when it's ready. 
<laughs> there you go, like Ma used to say. October 26 is when the North American tour starts. It goes all the way to the end of November. It's great to see some Canadian dates there, of course, multiple U.S. dates. Look forward to seeing your show in Montreal. Blackie, thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, we'll All talk right, again. well, thanks for again. having me. 